his blood that cost a life that paid my way death its price when it flowed down from the cross my sins were gone my sins forgot there is a grave that tried to hide this precious blood that gave me life but in three days he breathed again and rose to stand in my defense and so i come to tell you he's alive to tell And the lonely find It has the power To free the bound As chains they fall Upon the ground So pour it out To cleanse my soul Wait.
try to hide this precious blood that gave me life. In three days, he rose again. from the shedding of blood there can be no forgiveness of our sins so we that know him today stand in that power stand in that joy and may we live and serve in that joy Thank you. 
Amen. That song never gets old. Amen. <laughs> Let's pray this morning. Thank you, for, Lord, for your amazing grace, the blood that was shed, the life that was given, and the resurrection to freely offer eternal life to all who trust in you. Thank you, Lord. We're not worthy, couldn't earn it, not deserving, couldn't buy it, but you paid the price. And we rejoice and celebrate in that this morning. And I thank you for what you've done for us in Christ's name. And amen. You may be seated. I want to welcome everyone. Glad you're here this morning. We appreciate you being here. All I guess we're always glad that you're here with us. And those watching by way of TV and online, we appreciate you being here. And got some things to remind you of. In your building this morning, you have an insert. Wednesday Night Lights. It's a listing of all the classes that we're going to be offering beginning August 16th. And uh, this year we're doing a little bit different. All you got to do, you don't have to sign up, just show up. We're looking forward to you being there for that. And we've got a lot of different offerings there for men, women, and co-ed classes. And we've got a sl slide we want to show you too about Blitz Week. If we can find it. There we go. Our students are going to Blitz Week this week, and uh, they're going to be learning a lot and uh, celebrating and having a great time and learning. And the guy down here in the bottom right, I don't, you need to pray for him. <laughs> he needs our prayers as he leads. We certainly appreciate Brother Rob. So be praying about that and remember that. And we're certainly honored this morning, John and Beth and their family being here with us. It's a, a day of celebration for them as they go on to the next chapter of life, but it's also a time of just, can we grieve? Yes. Is that all right? <laughs> We sure lo certainly love John and Beth, and we're glad that they've been here with us for 17 years, and there'll be more said about that. But uh, really appreciate them and all they've done for our church. Appreciate you being here this morning. So let's continue to worship this morning. God has been good, hasn't he? He really has. And this morning, let's take a few moments to remember what he has done for us. Our 
please be seated. Choir, you can slide on out. This is a bittersweet day for me, but I am so blessed to be a part of you. We are bound together by the Spirit of God. I am so thankful for the 17 years that God has given me the privilege to serve with this incredible music team, with our pastor, the staff, the, just everybody has just been such a blessing. They love the Lord and it shows. You love the Lord and it shows. So this morning, in everything, give thanks for our God is good. Thank you.
God is so good. He's so good to me. And all my life you have been faithful. And all Amen. I must say that a big part of the goodness of God in my life has been the privilege of working with John and Beth Green. And I'm so grateful for that great privilege. Tonight, brothers and sisters, or actually this afternoon beginning at 5 o'clock, we're going to have a drop-in reception for John and Beth so appreciative that their family could be here. Philip, Michael, thank you all so much for being here on this very, very special day as we have an opportunity to honor your parents. And um, I pray that, that you all will know that we love you with all of our heart and always will. And the great thing is they're not moving, they're just transitioning. So there, after a few weeks of R&R, &R, they're going to be back with us and hopefully helping us and ministering alongside us, and we're so grateful for that. Take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6, verses 9 through 12 will be our text, and it's page 1065 in your pew Bible in case you did not bring a copy of God's Word but want to follow along. Some of you may not know this story, but when Brother John and Beth came to us from Dallas, Texas, 17 years ago, it was the very next Sunday that our pastor serving at the time announced his resignation as pastor. John had been here one week, and a couple of our knucklehead choir members, our guys, told me, Pastor, we were so afraid that John and Beth might move back to Dallas that after the service and after that announcement, we went hunting for John Green, and we found him. And we knew he was still in boxes, and we knew that he could just turn around and go back to his church in Dallas. But John said this to those men. By the way, I will, not, I will only give you their initials. Their initials are Gary Porthris and Derek Hicks. <laughs> but John said to those two guys, no. God has called us here, and this is where we believe God wants us to be, no matter what. May I selfishly say this morning, I'm so glad, because a year and a half later, God called me here, and I've had the great privilege for working alongside of John and Beth for 15 and a half years. There was one comment made when Beth sang at uh, our very first service that they were here, one man made the comment, well, we don't know if John's any good, but we'll hire him just for her. <laughs> and uh, Beth, we love you so much. And John, Beth, both of you guys. I purposely chose the passage of Scripture that I want to just share with you today because of this very special Sunday. As we honor John and Beth, I want you to look at their lives, and I want this I want them to show you the example of what I'm about to share. 
and what I'm about to say today. I believe it will also speak to each one of us. And so I have woven some comments about John and Beth and their ministry among us among this message this morning, and I pray God will honor it. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 9 through 12. Listen what the writer of Hebrews says. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. Now listen to this. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end and that you do not become sluggish. The word there literally means lazy. That you do not become lazy but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. I've entitled this message, Faithful to the Finish. And I want to show you very quickly this morning four tremendous truth principles that are found in these verses that are about spiritual maturity and about our walk with the Lord and setting the example through our lives. Here is truth number one. Our maturity in the Lord will help us to discover our place of service. Have you found your place of service with the Lord? Listen, as we grow in Christ, I'm absolutely convinced we will want to find a place to serve the Lord. I have never been around a maturing, growing Christian that is satisfied with just sitting in the pew. Never. Now, I've been around some carnal believers before that they are very satisfied with that or coming a couple of days, Sundays a week or a month, and that's about it. I have met many of those, but I've never been around a maturing, growing Christian that is satisfied by not serving the Lord. There is no doubt that John and Beth both found their place, their right place of service when God called them here 17 years ago. John leading our tremendous worship ministry. I think back of all the music programs we've had, the living Christmas trees, all the Sunday after Sunday leading our worship, leading our choir. I remember when Beth came to me in 2008, I'd only been here less than a year, and she said, Pastor, what would you think about starting a little biblical counseling ministry? I said, Beth, I think that would be a great idea. She said, we'll just start out part-time. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is called Life Source Counseling, and we have five counselors as a part of that. Because why? Because both of these people found their place of service and ministry as they were maturing and growing with the Lord. They desired to serve the Lord and go above and beyond. The entire theme of chapter 6 is based on what the Hebrew writer said back in chapter 5. Turn there in your Bibles to chapter 5, verse 12, or look at the screen this morning. Look what he says to these believers. For though by this time, by this time, by this time, you ought to be teachers... Yet you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe, a baby in Christ. For solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil." Folks, babies are beautiful, but none of us want to have babies that stay babies. We want them to grow up, and we need to grow in our maturity in Christ. And then we need to, as we grow, find where God wants us to serve and plug into those places of service. Get this. I want you to see it on the screen. Get it in your heart. If you don't walk daily with the Lord, you will end up being a spectator, not a servant. You've got to be growing. You've got to be maturing. You've got to be, and certainly John and Beth set the example for that. 
Now go back to chapter 6, verse 9. Look what, again what he says in our text from this morning. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation. Two questions from that verse. Number one, church, what is salvation? What is salvation? Jesus said in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, as he stood outside the door of Zacchaeus, he said, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who are lost. Here's a dynamic principle. You can't be saved until you first know you're lost. And then when you know you're lost, you humble yourself before a holy God and you thank Him over and over by believing in Jesus Christ that He died for you on the cross of Calvary and that He rose again from the grave. You have to humble yourself by admitting you are a hopeless, helpless sinner and cannot save yourself. Then you believe by faith in Christ that He died on the cross. He paid for your sin. He rose up victoriously from the grave. But even more, you confess Him as your Savior and Lord and you commit your life to Him. It's what Jesus called being born again. Listen to these scriptures just in the Gospel of John alone. Jesus said to Nicodemus, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see nor enter the kingdom of God. John 3, 16 through 18, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 1, 12, and 13, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. Are you born again this morning? Do you know what salvation is all about? But then the second part of that, what are the things that accompany salvation? Some of us here would have to admit, well, I got saved back when I was a kid, but that's about it. There's no fruit, there's no evidence, there's no growth, there's no maturity, there's no nothing. I just kind of got saved, got baptized, and for the last however many years, I've just been kind of sitting around. Here are at least 10 things, and there are many more, but here's 10 that I came up with, 10 things that accompany salvation. This is just for starters. Number one, I renounce my past. I repent of my sin. Secondly, I find a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church, and I actually go to it. <laughs> Thirdly, I get baptized. Number four, I get into a Bible study group and begin reading, knowing, understanding my Bible. It also gives me accountability as well. Then I fellowship with other believers. I pray, I give, I tell others about Jesus. I discover my spiritual gifts. And then I find a place of service either inside or outside the walls of the church. These are the very first steps. These are the works that accompany a person who is saved. They accompany salvation. By the way, I've got to add this. Our students this week that I took to Israel, our college students, some of the most mature young men and women I've ever been around in my life. It, it, it was incredible. Here's a picture of our group uh, in the Judean desert. All they wanted to do was talk about the Lord. All they wanted to do is talk about the Bible. They wanted to talk about prophecy. They wanted to talk about Israel and how God's plan, what God's plan is. I'm telling you, these kids are a, gr a great advertisement for the job their parents have done in their lives, but also our great student pastor and college leaders and what they have done in the lives of these students. It was powerful. <laughs> we even had a young man proposed to his, to his future wife in Capernaum at the Sea of Galilee. And she said yes. <laughs> that might be, Brother Dale, that might be another ministry we can think about, you know. <laughs> Taking people over there who will get engaged. But do you see what I'm saying here? Our maturity as we walk with the Lord, it's going to be the driver to get us plugged in. To want to plug in. 
Man, I don't know about you, but I couldn't imagine sitting on the sidelines. I couldn't imagine. Coach, get me in the game. I got to be in the game. Our maturity, our walk with the Lord will drive us to a place of service. We certainly see that with John and Beth. Here's a second principle, second truth. Our ministry, therefore, is, is it important in its purpose to God and to others. Look what he says in verse 10. You have ministered to the saints and do minister. Folks, we're not coming to be served. We're coming to serve the Lord. Did you know a recent study that was done about the church over 75% of the people, now this is not just Baptist churches, but in churches all across America, said, what is the purpose of your church? Well, I want my church to be there when my children are born for my babies. I want them to be there when I get married. I want them to be there when I get sick or have some kind of tragedy. And I want them to be there when I die. But that's it. Over 75%. In other words... I want my church to be there when I'm hatched, matched, patched, or dispatched. <laughs> and that's all I care about. We, we got to do better than that. We are here and we've been born again and left here in order to be the arms and feet and mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ and in order to minister to other people. Some of us would take a huge step Listen, a huge step in our maturity. If we would just realize it's not all about us, but it's about finding others and pouring our lives into others in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Years ago, the Salvation Army was having its annual international convention. And General William Booth, who's the founder of the Salvation Army, had some physical difficulties and was unable to come to the conference. And so the leaders got in touch with him and they said, what is your message to us? And he cabled back one word, others. Others. Just to pour your life out for others. And certainly John and Beth have done that throughout their entire ministry. We're not to be like the woman who bragged and said, I've had a little party this afternoon at three. It was very small, three guests and all, just I, myself, and me. Myself ate all the sandwiches while I drank all the tea. And it was I who ate the pie and passed the cake to me. <laughs> How can we minister in and through the church? You can minister to somebody through your presence, through just being there when they're going through a storm or a trial, a difficulty, a death in their lives. We minister through our giving. We minister through our involvement. We minister through our encouragement. One choir member sent me a little message and said, Brother Dean, every time I think about joy, I see John and Beth's picture. Because they were just radiant all the time in their service for people, their service for the Lord, their leadership in the choir. And I thought, amen and amen. That's what I saw in their hearts, their lives as well. How do we pour our lives out? In encouragement or through teaching, through singing, through sharing, through serving. I, I've got to just tell you this, and, and, and John would be embarrassed if I told you this, but one day I went to Mitzi. I needed to talk to John. And I said, Mitzi, is John around? She said, no, he's not around. I said, is he going to be back soon? She said, well, I'm not sure, but one of our members who is at that time was blind had either a doctor's appointment or needed to go to the grocery store, and Brother John had gone to pick him up to go take care of him. Now, he could have easily in his position said, no, let somebody else do that. Let somebody else take care of that. But that's the kind of man and the kind of wife that we honor here today. The, this matters to others. Our service, our ministry matters to God and it matters to others. Paul said in Galatians 5.13, through love we are to serve one another. Peter said, as each one has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's great grace. James said, we are to visit the widows and the orphans. Jesus gave us the example in Matthew 20 when he said, serve one another even as the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. I love this poem. 
Lord, help me to live from day to day in such a self-forgetful way that even when I kneel to pray, my prayer shall be for others. Help me in all the work I do to ever be sincere and true and know that all I do for you must needs be done to others. Let self be crucified and slain and buried deep and all in vain. I know that I will rise again, so let me live for others. And when my work on earth is done and my new work in heaven's begun, may I forget the crown I've won while thinking still of others. Others, Lord, yes, others, let this my motto be. Help me to live for others that I may live like thee. That's a powerful statement. Listen, brothers and sisters, our maturity will help us to discover our own place of service. And then our ministry before God has an important aspect, and that is that we be the hands and the feet and the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our ministry is important because we are serving other people. But the question is, will God remember what we've done? Sometimes I think maybe we think, well, nobody even knows what I do in the church and they don't know the sacrifices that I make. They don't know how many weeks I spend in the nursery or with the preschoolers. They don't know all the little things that I do. Nobody ever sees that. But listen to me, God sees it. In fact, here's truth number three. Our God's memory is absolutely perfect. Our God's memory is absolutely perfect. He remembers everything that you and I do. Look at verse 10. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward His name. Brothers and sisters, our God is not a senile old God. He's not like your pastor. Don't anybody say amen to that. God never forgets anything. By the way, I just want you to know that I'm not aging, I'm ripening to perfection. <laughs> you know you're getting old when you come home from the store and almost half the stuff you take out of the bag says, for fast relief of. <laughs> Somebody said, Brother Dean, what, don't, don't you think you need to go to the health food store and buy more Health foods. Listen, at my age, Brother John, I need all the preservatives I can get. You know what I'm talking about. But God is not some old senile God that's going to forget all of those little secret sacrifices that you make for Him, for His glory and honor. I love the story about the couple in their 90s. Both of them are having problems remembering things, and during a checkup, the doctor tells them that they are physically okay, but they might want to start writing things down to help them to remember. Later that night, while watching TV, the old man gets up from his chair. Honey, do you want anything while I'm in the kitchen? And she says, will you get me a bowl of ice cream? Sure. Don't you think that you ought to write that down? No, ma'am, I can remember to get you a bowl of ice cream. Well, I'd like some strawberries on top of it. Don't you think you ought to write that down? No, ma'am, I can remember that you want ice cream with strawberries on top. And she said, and a little bit of whipped cream, too, on top of that would be really great. Don't you think you ought to write that down? No, ma'am, I do not need to write that down. I can remember that you want ice cream with strawberries with whipped cream on the top. And then he leaves the room. He toddles out of the room. He goes into the kitchen, and he is in the kitchen for 20 minutes. And he returns from the kitchen and hands his wife a plate of bacon and eggs. <laughs> She stares at the plate for a moment and says, where's my toast? <laughs> Aren't you glad, brothers and sisters, that God never forgets our labor of love? Now let's see, who are you? He's going through a file drawer. Who are you? What did you say your name was? That's not our God. Our God will never forget all the little things that we have done for Him and many, many things that John and Beth have done as they have served the Lord. 
and God has never forgot them. One more principle. Number one, are you maturing? Number two, have you found a place of ministry? Number three, God has a perfect memory. He's not going to forget what you have done for Him, all the sacrifices that you have made for Him, the sacrifice of time in His honor, in His name. Number four, and this is so important, especially in our day, our mission then is to be persistent to the end, to be faithful to the end. Look what the writer says in verse 11. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope. The word diligence means not only eager and faithful to serve, but it means to do it right now, to do it with speed, to be ready to go at any moment. For how long? Look what it says. Until the end. Tell us in the Greek till the day when things cease to be. In other words, till you and I die or till Jesus comes. Verse 12, that you do not become sluggish, that you do not become lazy. Rise up, O men and women of God. Man, we can rest when we get to heaven. But imitate, mimitase in the Greek, mimic those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me just as I imitate Christ. John and Beth over these last 17 years have given us the great example of a couple who are mature in their faith, who found their place of ministry, who God will never forget all the little things that nobody else saw them do. He will never forget those things. And they have been faithful to the last, as John announces today, his retirement. And John, we put a little tribute together for you and Beth. And we want you to see it. And as you watch it, we want, you to, say, we want to say to you guys, thank you for serving the Lord. As a ninth grade boy, I felt God's call to full-time Christian service and uh, throughout high school looked for ways to use the musical gifts that God had given me to honor the Lord. Since, I guess, mid-March, we have been in communication with uh, your pastor and staff and your uh, search committee. And uh, Beth and I have uh, been in deep prayer and uh, seeking uh, to know that uh, we are doing what God wants us to do and, uh, and been in prayer for this church. Thank you, John and Beth. Thanks, John and Beth, for the many years of friendship and workmanship with you. We love you. John's been my privilege to work with you the last 17 years, and we're sure going to miss you and Beth around here a whole lot. Thank you, John and Beth, for your service, and we love you very much. Wish you all the luck and loving for the, for the future. Thanks, John and Beth. We love you. Thank you, John and Beth. Thank you, John and Beth. Thank you, John, for having enough confidence in me to put a microphone in my hand. <laughs> Might have been a mistake. Thank you for giving to the Lord. For I am a life that was changed. Thank you for giving to the John, we love you so much, and I just want to thank you for how you've inspired me to sing better. John, we will miss you so much. Thank you for being our faithful leader. Thank you, John and Beth, for welcoming us nine years ago and making us feel like family. Thank you, John and Beth, for being our good friends, and thank you for using me, even though I can't read music. Thank you. Thank you, John and Beth. Thank you, John and Beth. We love you. Thank you, John and Beth. Thank you, John and Beth. I love you. And uh, okay, if you don't care, I want to tell you just one little story that happened to me today. I <laughs> Thank you.
there is joy in serving our Savior. And sometimes it's hard. And sometimes you're like, oh, again, another thing to do. Sometimes I think that way. But I know this, that as we do things and we do them for Christ, we will find joy. Thank you, John and Beth, for all you've done for us. We're going to miss you. We love you. John and Beth, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for your service here at First Baptist, and especially thank you for teaching us how to worship and in your leadership, taking us to the throne of God in worship. God blessed our congregation by bringing John Green here to be our worship leader. And what we soon understood is that God didn't just bless us with one, but with two people who are committed to the Lord and both lead us to the throne of God in worship. Brother John, your heart for ministry is unsurpassed. I see you, I see in you the same quality spoken of in scripture by the King David. So with a grateful heart, we thank you. We are so very honored to call you ours. Just remain standing, brothers and sisters. Thank you, John and Beth, for all that you guys have done for us, but all that you have done for the Lord. May we all serve the Lord with great gladness and be faithful to the finish.